You don't usually eat bloobs or straws with guac. It would be ridic and probs like cultural approach BT dubs. That's right. Today we're talking about truncations. Whether you think they're totes adorbs or totes obnox, there's something really linguistically interesting going on. And since I mentioned being one of the, let me count them, one, two of the world's experts on this, the other is Lawrence Bradlin, I've gotten a lot of requests for an explainer of the linguistics of totes adorbs trunks. Clearly my subscribers have a better idea of what's interesting in linguistics than my old Phonology 2 professor, who called my term paper on this, and I quote, dumb. That resulted, of course, in me getting scooped by Lauren, discussing truncations with her at a conference, joining forces, uh, presenting at a, another more prestigious conference, and of course becoming lifelong friends. Right on, Phonology Professor. You know who you are. Who am I kidding? He does not watch this channel. Anyway, time for serious linguistics. I'm Dr. Tay Tay Jones, and this is Langy Joe. Uh, I'm Dr. Taylor Jones, and this is Language Jones. There's some really interesting, well, linguist interesting stuff happening with truncations like adorbs. Before I explain, I just have to address the young, cute elephant in the room. This stuff is highly criticized. Some people hate totes more than they hate the word moist. It's not just the baby boomers, and it's not just men who hate it, but those are definitely the most vocal anti-totes camps. This is one instance of many in which language patterns used by young women are stigmatized. In fact, they don't even have to be used by women more, they just have to be perceived to be used by women more. So creaky phonation, aka vocal fry, that's uh, even though it's a technical term for something slightly different, and high-rising terminal are linguistically neutral, but in the Anglosphere, they drive some people absolutely crazy. In Mandarin, creaky phonation is just another way you know a word is third tone. Anyway, totes trunks are basically linguistically neutral, but associated with women and therefore stigmatized. Oh, and young women at that. They make use of patterns colloquially referred to as baby talk and formally referred to as hypocoristics. That's reduplication of truncated words like cray cray and some suffixes, especially high vowels like e and palatals like sh. But those are flavor. Those are sprinkles on the hot fudge sundae of truncation. I feel like a banana split is funnier. Leave me a comment and let me know which is funnier and why it's actually an egg cream. The thing that first got me interested in truncations like this is that they are very productive. That means you can improvise new ones on the fly and people know what you're saying. But there's also limits on it. And while some would still be understood, they just don't sound right to us. For instance, I said they're productive, but the word productive is hard to shorten like that. It's not impossible. Product. Products? but people don't find it as well formed as something like adorbs. I got interested in what intuitive knowledge people tap into in order to make these truncations and to evaluate them. What gives a truncation a good evaluation, in other words? Turns out there's a very specific and fairly simple pattern, almost simpler than igpe atenle. For a multisyllable word, you find the primary stress. Okay, real quick, stress is perceived prominence and it's related to but distinct from loudness. In English, there's this pattern where long words can have multiple stresses, but they're basically additive. You could write a whole dissertation on this, and actually Mark Lieberman did, and it was kind of a big deal. So in a word like incontrovertible, the vert is the primary stress, and we could say the in in incontrovertible has secondary stress. Incontrovertible. Okay, so you find the primary stress, and then you just lop off the rest of the word. Done. Not so simple. This is where the fun comes in. You maximize the syllable coda. So a syllable consists of an onset of some number of consonants, maybe zero, a nucleus that's almost always a vowel. I have to say almost because of Moroccan Arabic. And a coda that's some number of consonants, possibly zero. So legitimate isn't legit. You take that T. But you almost immediately run into issues with that simple explanation because English has rules we all know but don't know that we know about what kinds of consonants can go in an onset, not mm, and a coda, not and which can go together in what order. That's why calls is fine, but causal is just not right. It's why hotline bling sounds fine, but hotline bling is not a well-formed syllable of English. There's a pattern in English codas affected by what's called the sonority hierarchy. This hierarchy rates sounds from the most sonorous to least, or to put it in simpler terms for the kids watching, low open vowels like ah are based, laterals and nasals are mid, and voiceless stops are cringe. So what we have now is that you find the stressed syllable, lop off the end of the word, but keep as many consonants as possible, insofar as you can make a normal English syllable with them. Then you add a suffix. 
The default is S, but we'll get back to that in a second. But first, here's another cool thing about this. The way the word is casually pronounced is your starting point. For the adults watching, that means it's post-lexical after Kaparsky 1982. So lots of people delete the schwa, the a uh sound, and adorable. Adorable. So your starting point is the three-syllable adorable. Comfortable? Comfortable. So something can be totes comfort. And even better, sounds that just sort of happen in English because of articulatory ease, those get included. So if you say grocery store instead of grocery store, you totes go to the grosh. If you say bedroom instead of bedroom, congrats, you've got a bedge. So English has a lot of sh and j sounds in the middle of a trochee like international, but not really at the end of words. I mean, sure, there's cash, hash, rash, but not a lot of the longer ones, and that's for historical reasons. Hashtag Norman Conquest, hashtag Guillaume le Conquérant. And we have vanishingly few words with je, and they're all loans from French. Garage, rouge. If there's more, leave me an example in the comments. I can't think of any. Well, guess what? Most of those are the result of a historical process related to high vowels after a stressed syllable. So now you have your coda, and also the end of your word. And also like a really strong clue that you're doing the whole totes thing. And you can be super cash about it, even though it's an unused word final sound. How do you even spell that you're unused but cash about it? Leave me a comment. Maybe leave me a comment with how to spell cash. Okay, now the part of this that I hadn't really grokked that Lawrence Bradlin put me onto is that there's a lot going on with the suffixes, and some of it fits some cross-linguistically interesting patterns. In the conference talk we gave at the Linguistic Society of America, we had this chart showing basically that you can add o, o's, z, e, is, or z's. Someone with fewer suffix choices might be totes jelsies. Quick aside, we were approached by a science reporter for a very well-known periodical, and this reporter interviewed us both and wanted to frame the story in terms of how young women are ruining English, or whatevs. And we both explained that that's not how this works. That's a linguistic ideology with no basis in science, and that it's a social phenomenon that has more to do with misogyny than with linguistics. The reporter kept trying to walk us into saying something that could be used as a sort of soundbite for the opposite view. This kept happening for, like, weeks, and finally they just didn't run an article about our research. You know, the research they claimed was so interesting. Okay, even more interesting, there's a lot of what appears to be affective palatalization. Palatalization is where you go, shh, 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 and affective means it's emotion. There are some linguists who claim that cross-linguistically, shh sounds are used in baby talk, and hypothesize that it's because, and I'm paraphrasing here, Babies have tiny little cute baby little baby cute little baby cute little mouths. Tiny little cute little baby mouths. And their tongues are huge relative to their mouths, and everything basically comes out until you're older. Not to mention all those high vowels, which some claim are iconic of teeny tiny little things. This is where I guess I should ask if you all want a video explaining what linguists call the Kiki Booba effect, and or a classification of which of any given pair of things is Kiki and which is Booba. No face, Kiki. Totoro, Booba. Biden, Kiki. Trump, Booba. Hot dogs, Kiki. Burgers, Booba. China, Booba. Taiwan, Kiki. Unless you're comparing Taiwan to Japan, in which case, Japan, Kiki, Taiwan, Booba. Leave me a comment if you want a video on that. Okay, so we've got a language game that has complicated rules, but everybody just gets them intuitively, and it results in a lot of palatalized codas, and that's cross-linguistically baby-talky. For example, oosh is a cutesy diminutive suffix in Hebrew associated with, you guessed it, young women. Socially, it makes sense to use this kind of game when you're in an informal environment, say, family or friends, or girls' night. Language games like this can have a social function that solidifies an in-group bond. It's unusual but figureoutable, and there's a certain kind of person for whom that brain tickle and the resulting dopamine hit of figuring it out, and loving it or cringing at it, can reinforce and solidify friendship. But let's take stock of what we've seen so far. It's not just random clippings. It's not, as NPR credulously reported in 2014, a result of character limits on the platform formerly known as Twitter. If that were the case, people wouldn't tweet heat, sheet, yeet? Things like BT dubs, let alone say them out loud. It's a language game in which people perform surprisingly complex calculations at lightning speed. If you were assigned homework that asked you to find the primary stressed syllable, maximize the coda while ensuring it's a phonologically licit uh, syllable of English, and prioritize palatal segments, you'd be like, I hate this stupid homework. Well, I would. It's a demonstration of just how much phonological knowledge people have without necessarily being conscious of it, or unconscious phonologicals. 
this isn't, ugh, Valley Girls are texting too much. Side note, Valley Girls are like an 80s thing. Those women are in their 50s now, at least, and texting was not a thing when Valley Girl was a salient type of young woman. Anyway, it's not uh, e-girls are texting too much. Let's be real, it's a millennial thing. But rather, young women are having fun in public. Or sometimes, I guess, women are having fun in public, and in a way that's too young, and therefore unbecoming or something. I guess sometimes it's also men are talking like young women and that they're, you know, having funsies. Society is collapsing. The last interesting thing about this to me is that most of it isn't that new. Like, legit, for legitimate, has been around since at least the 1980s. I definitely remember a lot of it from the 1990s. If you use Google Ingrams to investigate this, you'll get some false positives from the 1800s, but those are Latin. But congrats goes back to at least the 1910s. What's the difference between congrats and congratch? They're basically the same, but one has affective palatalization, maybe, and is from a post-lexical transformation. And I'm not 100% certain when congratulations became widely pronounced congratulations. So it's not even clear to me that there is a difference in terms of post-lexicals between both of these, other than just time. Tempest Fuge, my dudes. And things like congrats and legit have become words in their own right that are now legit in relatively formal settings. It's like I always say, today's cash reg is tomorrow's form reg. Tempe Fuge. If you like this video, as always, please like, sub, and comment. Thanks to my pates. If you want to become a patron, the link is in the description. I've got merch. Be honest, would you even clock merch as a truncation in another vid? What about vid? I got merch, including this famous quote from Verge, I always say. And if you like this video, you might like this one. Until next time.